It's a great pleasure to um, to uh, introduce and, and then moderate this panel and to uh, welcome you on behalf of uh, the American branch of the International Law Association, which is a co-sponsor of, of this event, uh, and in particular to welcome our, our two panelists. Uh, I will introduce them quickly because you probably already uh, know them, but um, uh, John Bellinger is a partner in the law firm of Arnold and Porter uh, and also an adjunct fellow, uh, senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. From 2005 to 2009, he served as the legal advisor uh, at the State Department for Secretary Condoleezza Rice. Uh, for the four or five years before that, he worked in the White House as senior associate counsel to the president and legal advisor to the National Security Council. Previously, he had uh, worked at the Department of uh, Justice and also uh, the CIA. And, and to embarrass him, I'll say he's recently been elected to the Council of the American Law Institute, which is a well-deserved honor, John. Our other panelist is Professor Rosa Brooks, who's a professor here at uh, Georgetown University Law Center who serves as the Associate Dean for Graduate Programs. She teaches in the areas of international law, national security, and constitutional law. And I'm sure you uh, know that she's the author of a fairly recently published book, How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything, which reflects in part on her service uh, from 2009 to 2011 as counselor to the Under Secretary of Defense for policy, Michelle Flournoy. Both are frequent commentators, uh, bloggers, um, experts in the area. Uh, I've worked both with and for both of them, and I'm delighted to moderate uh, the discussion. So we'll, we'll proceed in the following manner. I'm going to ask a question and see if we can get some debate going, question or two or three, and see what topics come up. I, uh, we have about an hour, and I'd like to leave some time for questions, so keep your Keep your notes handy. Um, and um, I want to thank you both for agreeing to uh, do this. Um, and the question of, for, for us um, is uh, international, not only international law in the Trump era, but more specifically, will international law matter to the Trump administration? Now, we don't have a lot of empirical evidence on which to, to go. We have some comments during the campaign that uh, um, suggested, at least to me, that international law wasn't particularly high on, on the mind of the campaign or, or, the, or the candidate. Uh, and we may not know until the Secretary of State has been confirmed and has chosen a uh, legal advisor. We may not know enough to make a, uh, uh, any kind of a reasoned conclusion to prognosticate with any kind of certainty. Uh, but um, events have a way of serving up issues, of causing, forcing the government to confront issues of international law, whether they're ready or not. Uh, and probably they're going to come up in the context of, of posing the problem of is international law relevant to a policy decision? Does it act as a constraint? Is it, um, uh, does it force a question of what international law, uh, what the value of international law is? So let me ask as a first question to get our discussion going uh, to both of our panelists, what do you think are the most likely uh, issues of international law to engage the, the new administration in the short run, and do you have any thoughts on how this administration might or ought to approach issues of international law of particular significance? And then I'm going to sit down and we can have our discussion. Mr. Rizzo? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Dave, for, for being our moderator. It's great to be here. Um, and I also appreciate the fact that the event organizers were willing to shift the time around. I'm, I'm, I'm the reason you were stuck here for lunch so long, because I had a, a prior commitment earlier in the day. So I appreciate the fact that you're all still here. Um, you know, obviously, this is a little bit of a crystal ball question. Uh, I think everybody in the country and indeed much of the world is, is asking themselves the same question. You know, what will the Trump administration do? Uh, and nobody has the faintest idea. The, the signals thus far, as, as Dave said, certainly suggest that uh, international law obligations and maintaining the, the international order as we have traditionally understood and as there has traditionally been a, a bipartisan consensus around is not high on President Trump's agenda. 
uh, his actions today in, in declaring that he was going to repudiate the uh, TPP obviously suggests that he, he, at the moment, is giving every sign that he intends to live up to his own campaign promises on those issues. Obviously, he also, at various points during the campaign, indicated that he planned to uh, get the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement, uh, that he wanted to get out of the Iran deal, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that's, that's, those are the signals he's sending. I, I think that the big question, um, I guess I think there are two big questions. You know, on the one hand, I see no reason to doubt so far that he, that he intends to do what he said he would do. Uh, and the, the, the two big questions, one are will his senior officials, his top cabinet nominees, and uh, persuading him otherwise. I mean, clearly, we have already seen some substantial differences emerge uh, between, for instance, President Trump and uh, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, who has indicated his own view, despite a lot of skepticism about Iran, would be leave the deal as it is, that his view on NATO and other international treaty commitments and alliances is they're really important, don't mess with them, and so forth. Uh, how much will that impact the president? remains to be seen. Um, and then the second question, I think, is how much does the reaction of the rest of the world end up impacting the president's decisions? And I think, I think his, his clear gut reaction is, I don't care what the rest of the world thinks. I'm going to do America first. We're going to do what we're going to do. Who cares? But I think he will probably find, as, as every administration has before him, um, that there's a, I'll paraphrase a, a line that's often attributed to uh, uh, Trotsky, I think, or maybe it's Lenin. I always get this mixed up, the attribution. I, plus, I think it's a, it's a fake attribution in any case. But uh, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. Uh, and I think that many presidents have found that you may not be interested in international law, but international law is interested in you. Uh, because even if we say we don't care about this international obligation or that international obligation, other states do care. Other states have courts in this globally interconnected world. Other states have the ability to make our life as a nation uh, much, much more difficult if they choose to do so. And so he may find, uh, whether it's looking at the Iran deal or the Paris Agreement, uh, he may find that the ability of other states, including traditional U.S. allies, to cause so much inconvenience and pain for him and for the United States, including pain for his ability to accomplish other objectives, that even if he doesn't want to, he's forced to say, OK, it's just not worth it. It's not worth the price that we will pay getting out of this. That being said, once again, uh, I don't really have a crystal ball. I wish I really wish I did right now. Uh, so, and it is really anyone's guess. Great, thanks, Rosa, and thanks, David. Um, I've uh, I've been privileged to learn from both David and Rosa over over all the years. David uh, worked with me for four years in the legal advisor's office, and I learned much of my. Uh, own knowledge about international law from David, particularly about immunities. And I was just saying to Dean that uh, when I was in the uh, White House after 9-11 and we were uh, scrambling around really trying to figure out what international law applied to al-Qaeda, uh, since the Geneva Conventions really do not by their terms apply to a conflict between a state and a non-state, and I was really looking around for what to read. One of the first articles I came across was by Rosa. Was that even, a, was it a student note or was that your inaugural? <laughs> I was a real grown-up. Uh, that, that. Were you a grown-up <laughs> at that point? Anyway, I've been learning from Rosa for a long time. Um, I, I think I'll start by basically trying to say what I think the, uh, the uh, uh, Trump administration is not going to be, because I think we, may, we, we don't know what it is going to do, but I think we know certain things it's not going to do. Um, the Obama administration in the international law area and the national security law area was really sort of government by lawyer. Uh, and if you've read Charlie Savage's book or read the reviews of Charlie Savage's book, the theme essentially was uh, that either because the Obama administration was trying to not be the Bush administration, or maybe this is just because this is who they were, or both, uh, they spent enormous amounts of time worrying about uh, international law issues. Now, part of it really was that you had a, a president and a vice president, and obviously an attorney general, but also a secretary of state, all of whom were really quite 
uh, gifted uh, lawyers. Uh, you know, Biden had been chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, chairman of the Judiciary Committee, deeply steeped in all this stuff. The president had been a constitutional lawyer. Hillary Clinton was a lawyer. Eric Holder had been uh, had, had, had been dealing with these issues as deputy attorney general for years. So they spent a lot of time just worrying about law and international law and trying uh, to actually do legal decision making in the international law area by consensus. So I don't think we're going to see that in the Trump administration. Um, uh, you know, part of it is just the personalities are going to be very different. You know, Trump himself has zero experience in this area. Uh, you know, we have had governors before, like the president I uh, most recently served, George Bush, who you know, had to deal at least with some international law issues when he was governor of Texas. He had a lot to learn, but he at least had some exposure. You know, Trump really, other than maybe certain tax rules, has not had to worry about international law, and I don't know that Vice President Pence has uh, much as well. So I just don't think these are going to be, they're going to spend at the, at the principal level as much time on these issues uh, as the last administration did. We're just not going to see that. Um, uh, the big $64,000 question is there going to be real skepticism or hostility towards international law. You know, I think that's what you know, many uh, uh, of our allies, particularly in Europe, are wondering. It's what uh, you know, sort of the international law community is wondering. And I, I think we just are not going to be able to tell that until we uh, see some of the people who come into the administration. Are we going to see real uh, a well-known international law skeptics like uh, John Bolton or others come into the administration who will really take on uh, international law, customary international law in particular, treaties, particular treaties, withdrawals from treaties, uh, taking on uh, international tribunals, the ICC, the ICJ. I think we'll, we'll look into something. We just, we haven't seen any of that yet. We know the uh, Heritage uh, Foundation has got some people on some of the landing teams, and there have been some uh, skeptics uh, at that level, but we don't know whether these people will be going in uh, to some of the key positions. So it really may be, and I gather this was a theme earlier during the day today, it may be very personality dependent um, uh, as to who's the legal advisor, who is the uh, the DOD general counsel. Uh, it's widely reported that Steve Engel will be uh, OLC, uh, head of OLC. Steve has a fair amount of experience in this area uh, already, and I think that's, that's going to be a very good appointment. But um, uh, Trump himself, you know, I think as we know, is not particularly ideological. Um, I, I don't think he's ideological, reflexively uh, ideological on international law. He made some statements that you know, I think were you know, uh, uh, at least provocative, like, you know, who were the eggheads who came up with the Geneva Conventions? Um, you know, I, as a former White House lawyer and legal advisor, I think, you know, he, he is going to, and, and, and the Vice President Pence are just going to have to be educated on some of these things because we've, you know, you have to separate the international law wheat from the chaff. There's certainly treaties that you can complain about, but there are certainly many other treaties that we very much support. Uh, uh, and I think the president and the vice president are going to have to spend a fair amount of time trying to get it, get briefed on, you know, so that they don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, but uh, we'll have to see who comes into a number of these positions uh, to see what approach they take with respect to these individual agreements, treaties, and um, international institutions. So I'd say really too early to tell. If the, uh, if the presumption is that uh, at least by training, experience, or inclination, uh, international law not, might not be at the forefront, uh, then I'll come back to the question I asked. Maybe this uh, question will be forced by events. Uh, perhaps the first area that the new administration will encounter questions of international law is exactly in the area of withdrawing from, from agreements. Uh, and that probably won't pose significant difficulties, I think, if you're talking about uh, the Paris Agreement or the JCPOA or the trade agreements that, that uh, as an international lawyer might suggest those aren't going to be particularly uh, forcing events because the law there is, is permissive in, in the circumstances. But what about um, law of war issues or you mentioned international courts or tribunals, John? Um, there is a case against us in the ICJ which might uh, 
which might um, uh, come up uh, fairly fairly soon. Sure. Well, although let me, I, I don't think, unless you've covered it all already during the day, I wouldn't gloss over quite so quickly over uh, the Paris Climate Agreement and the Iran deal, uh, because it, there, there are obviously different things that the Trump administration could do. The, you know, uh, as a candidate, uh, uh, Mr. Trump said that he was going to cancel the Paris Agreement, and he said he was going to rip up the Iran deal. Now, those are not for us international lawyers, those are not international law terms, but is he actually going to do something with respect to either one of them? So I did think we might want to deconstruct them a little bit. Uh, did you all cover this fully this morning already? So I mean, on, on, on Paris, if you wanted to do something with respect to Paris, there are treaty, uh, uh, the, you, you cannot withdraw from the treaty, you can't actually provide notice to withdraw from the treaty for three years, and then it takes another year before that to become effective. So pursuant to the terms of the Paris Agreement, the United States can't withdraw for four more years. The, uh, that would be pursuant to the terms. The, the nuclear option, which we have heard bandied about a little bit, would be for the, uh, for the U.S. to withdraw from the overall framework convention on climate change, which, of course, was joined by the George H.W. Bush administration, has been the framework for all climate uh, discussions for the last, uh, whatever, 25 years. That, that would be a nuclear option and would be really upset the rest of the world and would take us out uh, uh, from climate discussions uh, and, uh, with the rest of the world. If we did that, then we could withdraw from the Paris Agreement within one year because there's a provision of the Paris Agreement that says if you withdraw from the overall framework agreement, which you can do within one year, then you also are deemed to have withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. You know, frankly, all of those things are, are really more ideological than practical because the requirements of the Paris uh, Agreement are really not that great on the United States. The only a real binding, significant binding obligation, in fact, you even call it significant, is the binding obligation was to announce a, a, client, a, a carbon uh, reduction goal, which the United States did, and we've already announced it, so already, but we're not, it doesn't require us to meet the goal. So uh, now we could withdraw the goal so that we don't even, don't even have a goal, but since we're not required to meet the goal, uh, the, 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 the Trump administration could simply uh, take domestic action uh, to withdraw the clean energy plan, but still be in compliance with treaties. So we'll have to, you know, see: do they do they formally withdraw from Paris? Do they go the nuclear option to withdraw from the framework agreement, uh, uh, or do they really go more of a sort of a go slow approach on the Iran deal? Uh, again, it can't really be, it, it, as most of you know, that's neither a treaty nor an international agreement. It's not binding. It's simply a political declaration by the signatories in which they say that not that they shall do certain things, which would be a binding international law term. They say they will do certain things, which is a statement of political intent. So it's not binding anyway. Now, the, what the Trump administration could certainly do is just not do the things that the Obama administration said that they would do, um, uh, such as continuing to lift the sanctions. So they could unilaterally reimpose sanctions on Iran. Uh, now, uh, both General Mattis and Bob Corker have now said they think that the Trump administration shouldn't do that. Uh, if we if we unilaterally reimpose sanctions on Iran, um, it frankly is not terribly effective other than hurting U.S. companies because the the rest of the world will continue to main, uh, uh, to to uh, uh, have withdrawn sanctions and are not likely to reimpose them. So. It's possible that the Trump administration could try to renegotiate certain parts of the Iran deal, uh, but that, of course, means that you've got to have a willing partner on the other side. So that would be very difficult to do. We can get into some of the details. I'll just end, sorry, on the, I riffed for a bit on the, when you glossed over the first two on the, on the uh, ICJ case. If you're not aware, um, Iran has sued us before the International Court of Justice uh, 
after a Supreme Court case last year, the Bank Markazi case, that allowed the seizure of, of Iran's central bank assets in the United States to pay certain terrorism judgments. Uh, Iran sued us pursuant to a treaty that David will have to explain to me, why didn't, why didn't we ever withdraw from this? The Treaty of Amity between us and Iran. I actually really do not know why we, uh, th here's a treaty that I, I do wonder why we are still party to. In any case, the, uh, uh, we are still party to an agreement with Iran, the Treaty of Amity. Uh, Iran sued us saying that we had violated it by seizing their central bank assets. Um, and that is just in the very early stages of litigation. Um, if the uh, Trump administration, I think this will come down to the new legal advisor, uh, really wanted to be aggressive and provocative, and I frankly wouldn't recommend this, uh, is they could just stop going to the court and, and, and refuse to appear anymore. Um, uh, we have some good jurisdictional arguments to defend ourselves, so I would certainly recommend that we at least continue to appear to make our jurisdictional arguments and then see what happens uh, at that point. Uh, but uh, you know, that's, they, they could uh, decide that they're just not going to appear anymore before the ICJ uh, because, uh, because Iran has sued us, admittedly, before a treaty to which we're a party. I mean, Dave, you, you started us off by saying uh, what, what is the Trump administration likely to do and what should they do? The second question is easier to answer than the first. And on this, I think that there probably is a fair amount of bipartisan consensus that, that most people would say, you know, the Iran deal is what it is. It's not perfect, but taking it apart will hurt us in all kinds of ways, reputationally, unilateral sanctions reimposed by the U.S. in the face of clear European and other allied indications that they, that they aren't going to do that would be ineffective anyway, so leave it alone. Ditto Paris Agreement is one of the few times I found myself in, in agreement with uh, Fox News' Bill O'Reilly, who uh, advised uh, President Trump to leave it alone. It doesn't really do anything. It doesn't have that many teeth. Why bother? Go fight some other fight. Uh, and I think, you know, the same is true of the ICJ. You know, down the road we can decide what to do, but, you know, why, why, why do you want to be like China? Why do you want to be seen as visibly flouting international tribunals when you're trying to say and hold other states to upholding rule of law principles, et cetera? So I think that, you know, the, the logic uh, suggests that, you know, find, pick other battles. Don't pick these battles that you don't really gain very much if you withdraw from any of these. And, but in fact, we do. We do nothing but hurt ourselves, and we don't really actually gain anything significant. Whether that logic, will that logic be powerful to Rex Tillerson, Jim Mattis, et cetera? I suspect it will. Will that logic end up, in fact, changing Donald Trump's mind, nobody knows. Obviously, we already have some significant indications that he doesn't always follow the advice of his senior most advisors. They say things like, don't pick silly fights over crowd size, and he goes and picks silly fights over crowd size, and so on. So, so, so unfortunately, I, th you know, I think all bets are, are, are still off in terms of what he, what he actually does on any of these issues. Uh, I don't know, do you want us to move along to uh, did some you of the other issues you want to do a I was just going to ask uh, Rosa this question. Uh, one could uh, take the phrase America first as, as indicating um, a position that says, uh, imply a position that says, we'll only follow um, uh, international law or other legal requirements when it's in our interest to do so. On the other hand, you might say, well, uh, uh, it is in our interest to, to uh, adhere to the law, particularly in the areas of uh, law of war and use of force. And so, Rosa, I wondered if, um, if perhaps from your point of view and your experience, one area in which this issue might come up fairly mm -hmm. early is, is in the areas of law of war, mm -hmm. humanitarian law, use of force. Sure, and, and obviously the question of whether following international laws in our interest often depends on your, your time horizon. Uh, it's often inconvenient to abide by our international law obligations in the near term, uh, just as it's often inconvenient for all of us to abide by our domestic law obligations in the near term. But just as most of us decide that in the, you know, in the long run, it's probably smart for us to stop at red lights and pay our taxes and so forth, you know, we get something out of this at the end of the day. Uh, most states, most of the time, and you, you all know uh, Lou Hankin's famous, famous phrase of almost all states abide by almost all of their international law obligations almost all the time, just because that's what makes the world go round. It's, you know, even states need friends, uh, you need rules of the road, you need, you need settled understandings, you need predictability and so forth. So I think that it's, 
generally speaking, and you know, this is obviously a, a very broad statement, you know, th there's a reason the U.S. Has, has long been the champion and the guarantor of the post-World War II international order. We benefit from it. We benefit from it in all kinds of ways, notwithstanding the numerous short-term inconveniences that oppose us to us. And I think that's going to continue to be true, not, not only notwithstanding the, the short-term inconveniences, but notwithstanding the fact that there are all kinds of things that, you know, would we like to change them? Should we change them? Would it be better not only for us, but for the world to change them? Sure, absolutely. On, on the law of war stuff, uh, you know, here again, I, I, who knows, right? Um, we have seen, uh, I think there, there are two, two issues in particular that, that raised, uh, rang alarm bells during the campaign. One was uh, uh, then candidate Trump's comments on uh, waterboarding and, and torture, uh, and the other were his comments on uh, potential targeting of family members and children of, of suspected terrorists. And obviously from a legal perspective, uh, uh, reintroducing waterboarding, and as he put it, a hell of a lot worse, would, would violate our current laws as well as, in my view, international law very clearly, but equally targeting the family, children of terrorist members, terrorists, because that's the only way to get to them, would also clearly violate uh, international law and U.S. law. Uh, he did get immediate pushback from, again, uh, General Mattis. Uh, uh, in his testimony, Mike Pompeo, his nominee for uh, head of the CIA, um, repudiated his own earlier support for waterboarding, uh, and, and many of his senior nominees under questioning in the Senate uh, have, have backed away from those positions. Um, so here, here too, you know, will the better angels of the Trump administration uh, end up guiding him? I, I certainly hope so. I, I think it's, and John, you may, I, you may have some reflections on this. I think it's sort of interesting to look back, look back at both the, the good and the bad of the sort of early days of the first George W. Bush administration, uh, the ways in which I think the there's bad news and there's good news. You know, on the one hand, the bad news is that you don't have to necessarily change the laws or change the minds of most people in order to do something that is illegal and unethical. You just need to have a small group of people willing to do that, and you need to be willing to bypass ordinary processes uh, to do that. Uh, and that's the bad news, that the fact that the uniformed military, for instance, pushed back, that Secre then Secretary of State Colin Powell pushed back very hard against some of the uh, Bush administration's interpretations, as did indeed to John uh, in his then role as State Department legal advisor, against some of the interpretations of the law that the others in the Bush administration were coming up with. Um, did that win the day? No, it didn't. So that's that's the bad news. The The good news is that, you know, in the longer term, things come around again, and, and that, that interesting, that this is another example of the fact that we may not be interested in international law, but it's interested in us, uh, that ultimately pressure from many of our own allies did push the Bush administration, as well as media pressure and public pressure, to, to a, a substantial course correction in, in the second half of the Bush administration, uh, that, that it's hard to persevere when your own allies are saying things like, we're not sure we can turn detainees over to you, uh, because we're worried that we'll be liable in our domestic courts for what you do if we are complicit in turning them over to you. you know, those things and do end up making a difference uh, even to states that start out saying, oh, it doesn't matter to us, we don't care. Uh, in the end, you know, we need cooperation, we need it on multiple fronts, and you can't neatly separate out any one issue from the others. If you piss off your allies on one issue, they may not want to help you on another issue where, where you need their help. And I'll just say on the laws of war, I think you know, there's so much water over uh, this dam at this point that I would think there would be a good deal of pushback, David, from you know, actually all the departments on uh, you know, not just the, the, the things that are clearly illegal violations like uh, waterboarding or targeting uh, of family members, but even you know, a return to some of the more aggressive uh, legal arguments of the first term of the Bush administration. I just think we would see the Justice Department litigators, the Defense Department, uh, uh, you know, not just the, the, some of the traditional opponents of the State Department, but I think we would see the lawyers in the Civil Division, I think we would see lawyers of the Defense Department push back on some of these things. So if, if, for example, some of the things that have been said by politicians, like let's 
uh, let's reopen Guantanamo and start sending more people there. You know, let's start labeling Americans as enemy combatants. Uh, let's hold Americans at, under the laws of war in the United States. You know, if we find somebody, one of these many people, unfortunately, who's committed a uh, terrorist attack under uh, under uh, you know ISIS inspiration here in the United States, let's not put them in the criminal justice system. You know, let's go lock them up in a military brig. Let's try to strip people of their citizenship. All of these ideas ideas have been tried and thought about, you know, in the Bush administration uh, and, you know, the Justice Department, I think, now will tell you, you know, we just can't defend most of these things anymore. It's just not going to work as a practical matter. We've been there. We've done that. It's just not going to work. So, you know, when we see various members of Congress saying, you know, we're now going to, you know, we find a Boston bomber, we're going to send him off to Guantanamo, I think you'd see uh, a real, real pushback from, uh, from the litigators who have had to deal with these things. For the last uh, for the last number of years, you know. That said, I, I do think we would see you know some more uh, aggressive actions. Uh, I just think that uh, you know it will not be uh, a return to some of the things that have been tried and essentially had failed before. Let me uh, turn to a somewhat different topic, and that's the question of uh, treaty ratification. You, you might instinctively think that um, this is not going to be on the top of the administration's agenda, certainly not perhaps the law of the sea convention or the Rome statute. But the fact is, historically, as you both know, uh, Republican administrations have been more active in the support of human rights and ratification of human rights and arms control treaties than uh, Democratic uh, uh, administrations have. Do you have any any thoughts on what might lie ahead in, in uh, those areas? Well, again, hard to predict, but let me give you some statistics that you may not know and that will surprise you. And when I go talk about this in Europe, I just can't believe it. The, during, during the eight years of the Bush administration, the Senate approved 163 treaties. That's more new international law than at any point in American history. Uh, in my last two years as legal advisor, we got 90 treaties through the Senate. That was more treaties in a two-year congressional term than at any point in American history. So when I go and talk in Europe, who, who constantly remind me how much George Bush hated international law, you know, I point out that he put on, uh, had the United States agree to more new international law than any point in American history. Uh, someone actually stood up at a conference once and said, well, you must be referring to all of the Article 98 agreements, aren't you? And I said, no, no those are not treaties and that's not what I mean. This is a broad array of uh, human rights, law of war, conservation, uh, environmental, uh, uh, mutual legal assistance, extradition, you name it, treaties on, on, on every subject. I think my favorite was the Polar Bear Convention. Uh, uh, the, during the Obama administration, the Senate only approved 20 treaties in eight years. That's the fewest number of treaties approved in American history in an eight-year term. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. Part of it is the Bush administration just cleared away a lot of treaties that had been negotiated and then we got them through. Obviously, uh, the Senate has turned and has become more hostile. Uh, uh, I personally think, and, and you know, Democratic friends get mad at me. Barney Frank actually wrote an op-ed uh, or a letter to the editor complaining when I pointed this out. I think the Obama administration just didn't work on it all that hard. They thought that the treaties just, you know, they were the Obama administration, and if they sent a treaty up to the Senate, it was going to get approved. Well, it takes hard work. I, I know. I have gone and testified in favor of a number of treaties for which there was skepticism. Um, and you do, you know, you got to get a large number of senators. You've got to get two-thirds, and if you want to get unanimous consent, you've got to make sure nobody is going to object. So it takes effort. Uh, so uh, you know, we'll have to see what's going to happen. As there are not that many treaties right now in the pipeline before uh, the Senate. Uh, a initial harbinger will be what's called the treaty priority list. Uh, in the first couple of months of the administration, uh, the NSC legal advisor, uh, my old position, and the State Department legal advisor, also my old position, will sort of get together and look at all the treaties that are pending before the Senate and then ones that have been recently negotiated and may go up to the Senate and decide, you know, what are our treaty priorities? And this is always a big issue as you could look at 
uh, you know, what treaties really are in our interest that are important for us and that we want to get done, and which are you know, maybe not so important. And, and then are there any that we oppose altogether? Uh, so there are, there are a couple of dozen treaties pending before the Senate right now. There's some tax treaties, some mutual legal assistance treaties. There's a uh, NATO accession treaty for Montenegro. There's some private international law treaties that David used to have this office and can tell you about them that will be very useful for American business uh, if we could get those through. So there are a number of pending treaties. Um, it's, I will tell you it's bothered me that there are a couple of senators now who now seem to be, frankly, just against all treaties. Uh, I, in my mind, they have, have sort of uh, uh, melded together kind of big multilateral treaties that they know they don't like with all treaties. And you know, we have to remember that we get a lot through, particularly through individual bilateral treaties, or also many other multilateral treaties, can be very useful for the United States uh, uh, and for American business and for other reasons. So uh, it, uh, we've not been able to move uh, you know, many tax treaties or even mutual legal assistance or extradition treaties in a number of years because of the opposition of just a couple of senators. So we'll have to see how much effort the new administration wants to put into pushing through some of these treaties. We'll have to look at their treaty priority list, and then they will have to work with the Senate uh, to, uh, so I don't know that there'll, again, that there'll necessarily be a reflexive hostility to some of the treaties that are out there. They're, the ones that are pending are, are actually not all that controversial, you know, assuming that the, the, the uh, UN Disabilities Convention, for example, doesn't, doesn't come back again. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the things that this, this illustrates uh, is that much of, much indeed the vast majority of what the executive branch does kind of chugs along without the active engagement of the president one way or the other. I assume that on those 120 treaties that went through during the Bush administration. 163. Uh, 100, just lost three of my but, treaties. Uh, so 163, my guess is that President Bush himself was aware of and engaged in discussions about only a fraction of them because most of them were just below the level of radar. They weren't that. Well, actually, let me just say one thing on that, Rosa, because this is an important thing to know. Uh, every treaty has to be personally transmitted by the President of the United States to the Senate. And so every one of these treaties went across George Bush's desk. And so at any point he could have said, why are we doing this? I'm sending yeah. this back. And then remember, uh, and, and, and do not make this mistake, <laughs> the Senate does not ratify treaties. The Senate, I know the Federalist Society knows this, the Senate gives its advice and consent to the president's ratification of the treaty. So it's a boomerang. After the, president, after the president has transmitted a treaty, the Senate gives its advice and consent. Then it comes back to the president, and then he ratifies it. So the president has to be personally involved uh, with the, each of these, anything that's actually treated as a treaty. Uh, and he, they, it, it is not delegated to the Secretary of State or to anybody else in the White House. Yeah. Um, we'll, not, we'll have to see if Mr. Trump actually does. I mean, no no know, question about, about it, right? The president can put the kibosh on any of these. But, but most presidents don't have the bandwidth to care about all of them. You know, they're going to care about a few of them. And on the vast majority, they're just going to say to their staff, what do I do? Is this OK? And the staff says, yeah, that's fine, or no, don't do it. And they say, OK, fine, because, because no president has the bandwidth to focus on. There's so many other things competing for the time and attention of the president. And that, that in many ways, is a good thing, right? That we have a, we have a professional, the, the much abused federal bureaucracy, uh, although there are plenty of things wrong with the federal bureaucracy, there are also plenty of things right with the federal bureaucracy, including having lots of very diligent, very competent, very careful people. And 99% of what happens just sort of chugs along without that much active involvement at the very top level. And that's, that's the way it should be. It's the way it has to be. Uh, you know, we don't want the president, any president, to be deep in the weeds on every single issue. And, and that will continue. You know, I, I confidently expect that, that that will continue to be the case, that the Trump administration, like every administration before, they will cherry pick a small number of things that they really care about. Uh, that they either want to stop or they want to ram through. And there's going to be lots of other stuff, some of which may not be entirely consistent with that broad vision that will kind of chug along regardless. The um, I, 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 only other thing I would add, uh, I suppose, uh, to what John says is it's, it's not doesn't surprise me that much that, that disparity between the number of treaties uh, uh, 
to which the Senate gave its advice and consent during the uh, Bush administration versus the Obama administration. One of the explanations for that, I think, is, is that Democrats uh, in the political climate we've been in for the last 30 years or so are more fearful of putting political capital behind, behind international treaties in the Senate. Uh, precisely because they feel like they have to overcome more inherent opposition, more inherent suspicion that they will trade away U.S. interests for international, for the sake of international law and so forth. So I think that the, I think, I think it's, it's quite fair to say that the Obama administration did not put an enormous amount of political capital behind getting some of the treaties that they, that they could have pushed, uh, advised and consented to and subsequently ratified. Um, but I think it's probably also fair to say that Republicans probably have an easier time doing that, just given the nature of the, the politics of our era. Uh, Rosa, let me follow up that uh, with, uh, with a more general question. Since both of you have worked at uh, very senior levels of government, that, that really is a question that uh, addresses the issue of the relevance of international law to executive decision making. To, to what extent, in your experience, uh, does international law or has international law actually operated as a constraint on uh, presidential action or, or, or the decisions of, uh, of senior cab cabinet uh, uh, officials? Is there something about international law issues that, uh, because it's, say, not familiar to them, makes it just a question for the lawyers or, or in your experience, do senior officials actually engage with the international uh, issues and take it into account? maybe to put that broad question and slightly differently, to what extent or how much of an obligation uh, do presidents or presidential appointees actually feel to stay within the bounds of international law? I think it varies, obviously. I, I think, as John said, uh, President Obama, himself a lawyer, surrounded by so many lawyers in, in amongst his senior most uh, appointees, uh, clearly cared very much about both the the forms of international law and the, and the substance. Uh, did that mean always or inevitably that the, the, the interpretations that the Obama administration came to were widely shared by our allies, by international law scholars and so on? No, not necessarily. But it certainly meant that the process of coming to interpretations and decisions was very much a lawyer's process. Uh, uh, I think other presidents have, have been less deeply personally invested and have had, had fewer senior advisors who were personally invested in, in the processes and forms of the law. Um, you know, again, on, on Trump, no crystal ball. He, you know, so many things about, about his uh, candidacy and I suspect his presidency are, are sort of wild cards that I hesitate to say much of anything beyond, beyond the, the reiterating something that's fairly obvious, right? That the, I don't think, I think that very few American presidents uh, or senior American policymakers take a formalistic view of, inter, of international law. Uh, I think that uh, they, never the, but nevertheless, I think that they recognize, uh, as indeed virtually every state in the international community, including so-called rogue states, uh, do take the view that it's the language of international relations and that you have to speak that language and that no matter what you want to do, uh, states, even the crazy ones, and leaders, even the crazy ones, usually feel an obligation to articulate what they want to do using the forms and languages of international law. And that in itself is a constraint. It's, it's not as much of a constraint as formalists would prefer it to be, obviously, but it's, but it's nevertheless, it's a fairly powerful constraint. Uh, will even that constraint be binding on Donald Trump? Who the heck knows? Um, but, but I certainly think that, again, you know, on the theory that, that the, you know, the U.S. government is, a, is an iceberg and the president's the tip of the iceberg, but no matter what the president does, quite a lot of stuff just keeps chugging along simply because the president does not have the bandwidth to change it all. Uh, you know, I, th I, think, I think by and large that will continue to be the case for the United States. I don't think it is likely that a Trump presidency, no matter what he chooses to do on any particular uh, issue, I don't think it's likely that a Trump presidency will radically and permanently change the U.S.'s commitment to being part of the international legal order. Uh, I suspect that 
worst case scenario for, for international lawyers. We have, we have four bad years that are, that are pretty chaotic and a lot of people are kind of mad at us. And then we self-correct. Best case scenario is that he, like so many other presidents before him, finds, finds that the costs of openly flouting, openly ignoring that language are just too high and it's just not worth the bother. So let me, I'll just say, I, you know, I, I think, going back to where I started, I don't think there will be quite so many sort of graduate level international law seminars inside the Situation Room the way I think there really were amongst, you know, President Obama, Vice President Biden, Hillary Clinton, the Attorney General, you know, Jay Johnson, also a lawyer when he was, you know, uh, Janet Napolitano, I and mean, we had very senior people who could could talk about these things. That said, you know, when I was in the Bush administration, we did not have as many lawyers. There was international law was still often discussed inside the Situation Room on different issues on uh, UN Security Council resolutions. Was something binding? Was it not binding? Did we want to agree to a particular provision that was under Chapter 7, under Chapter 6? You know, laws on the use of force, uh, uh, on uh, uh, the uh, uh, use of force in self-defense against non-state actors, uh, and, and a whole variety of you know, preemptive use of, of, uh, of force in self-defense. Could we uh, you know, one of the things that's come out in recent years uh, where there was disagreement in the administration, this wasn't known until years later, and we've now had sniping between my boss, Secretary Rice, and Vice President Cheney was, you know, should we have bombed the Syrian reactor uh, that was found in the last year of the Bush administration? Uh, and the, uh, it was clearly not an imminent threat to us, so that it would have been hard to argue that we could have used force against to bomb the reactor uh, in self-defense against an imminent threat posed by that reactor. Uh, we had, uh, in the Reagan administration, had criticized and joined a resolution uh, that had criticized Israel for bombing the OSIRIC reactor in Iraq. So we had, uh, 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 so we were hemmed in by that. So, you know, there were big discussions about, you know, whether it would have been lawful for us to have bombed the, uh, the, the Syrian reactor. As you know, the United States ultimately did not take any action. Israel did. Uh, uh, the Vice President Cheney later came out and said, you know, we should have done it ourselves. And Secretary Rice came out and said, no, we did the right thing. So there continue to be uh, you know, disagreements even in the Bush administration. But you know, that's all to say that there's a good deal of discussion about international law. That's one of the reasons why you have an NSC legal advisor and a counsel to the president uh, to raise these issues. Uh, and I do think a lot of this does get down to education. Uh, there may be a reflexive reaction that somehow all international law is bad, you know, uh, uh, until one gets educated on uh, how useful it is. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a state-centric example, meaning a, one of the states, the United States. Um, you know, one of the treaties that we benefit from, almost all of us have probably benefited from this, is the, the Road Traffic Convention of, I think, about 1953. This is a treaty that allows us to drive on our driver's licenses uh, uh, in every country in the world in which you would otherwise, if you complied with the law of a particular country, you'd have to go get a new driver's license. Uh, but there's a treaty that says we can drive on each other's driver's licenses. Um, Florida, a couple of years ago, in a fit of federalist sovereignty, uh, uh, decided, well, we don't want people driving on their driver's licenses. Um, they need to get a Florida driver's license. And they passed a state law that said, you have to have a Florida driver's license. Then something like uh, 200 million Canadians said that they would no longer be coming to Florida for the winter. Uh, and that the cost to the Florida economy was going to be in the billions of dollars, uh, in addition to the fact that this would have violated the Road Traffic Convention. And within two weeks, the Florida legislature then rescinded that law. So, you know, that's why one sees, in fact, the, you know, not every treaty is in our interest. There are plenty of treaties where I have had uh, countries around the world come to me as legal advisors say, you know, we want you to join this, and it's not in our interest. But there are also many, many treaties, bilateral, multilateral, uh, that give us enormous, uh, enormous benefits, uh, you know, every single day. And so that's the sort of the, the educational process uh, that any new administration has to go through. 
That, that's a great example of the dichotomy between the, the benefits of, of acting in conformance with the law and being seen to act in conformance with the law as opposed to uh, knowing and taking into account the benefits or adverse consequences of violating the law. Often, in my experience, it's the second thing that really gets decision makers' attention. The former, just are you in compliance or are you not, is often considered just one of the factors. But if you can detail to a policymaker, if you don't do this, if you violate this rule, then you're going to face potential consequences. Often that's, that's what gets their, their attention. So let us uh, open the, the floor now to, to questions. Um, yes, we have some time. Um, I'm wondering if you could draw the, the distinction in layman's term. I'm one of a few non-lawyers in the room. Um, between these um, executive things like Obama did and a, a treaty that's been advised and consented by the Senate, if you could draw that distinction, um, does the international community don't see, does not see a distinction? Or, or, I mean, obviously, legally, Yeah, it's a good question. It's confusing. Um, the, uh, the United States enters into uh, hundreds of hundreds of international agreements every year that are binding as a matter of international law, that, that uh, we agree to do certain things and other country agrees to do certain things. Most of those are now not done as treaties. Uh, they are, and, and this has nothing to do with Obama or Republicans and Democrats. It is an executive uh, uh, Senate thing. Uh, and there are only a certain category of international agreements are treated as treaties. And unfortunately, there's not a sort of a checklist that there has over time a general uh, a process of accommodation between the Senate and the executive is so things that have to be treated as treaties because it takes on a significant new obligation that may affect all the states. Um, uh, and actually, some relatively minor things like a tax treaty have to be done as a treaty, whereas there are some enormous things like a status of forces agreement with, with Iraq that are just historically always done as executive agreements and don't have to go through uh, through the Senate. So most international agreements are not done as treaties. Um, and then there's always a little bit of arguing each year as to whether something should have been treated or not treated as a treaty. So as we know, the Iran deal, you know, much uh, controversy as to this big deal with Iran, how could it not be sent to the Senate as a treaty? Well, that wasn't even actually a binding international agreement. As, as I said earlier, it was just a political declaration where we said we, the United States will do certain things. Now, admittedly, it was a big political commitment, and I think it was appropriate for Congress to review it. Um, but uh, you know, these are the these are the things that sort of uh, do get worked out in between the executive and the Senate. Uh, uh, year, year to year. I, th I think because of the fewer number of treaties that the Senate has been approving, we are seeing the executive, whether it's Democratic or actually, well, this will be an interesting question now we see this in a Republican administration, trying to get away with, or maybe that's too pejorative, trying to do as much as it can as an executive agreement so that they don't have to send it up to the, to the Senate uh, for uh, advice and consent. The only thing I would add is that, is that yes, you're, you're absolutely right. From an international law perspective, there is one United States and the rest of the world could care less about our internal processes and about our division, uh, our federalist principles and so forth. Uh, and they shouldn't have to, right? We don't want to have to say, oh, well, you know, we're going to have to negotiate in a different way with, with Germany than we do with Iran and so on. We want, to, we want to have one negotiator and we want to feel confident that whatever they agree to is what they agree to. Uh, and we don't want them to come back later and say, oh, yeah, but we forgot to tell you that, you know, we didn't consult with this other group or something like that. You know, so from an international law perspective, it makes absolutely no difference whether we have an, uh, an executive agreement or whether we have something that uh, is a, a treaty in our own constitutional terms that's been submitted to the Senate for its advice and consent and so on and so forth. It matters for US law purposes uh, in, in complicated ways too, too boring to go into here. Uh, but from an international law perspective, an agreement's an agreement. doesn't really matter what kind it is. Yes, in the back. Oh, yeah, yeah. please. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, well, my question is, can we uh, put this 
this with over oppression, but of international law matters to government. Can we put it in a more global context? There are similar developments in other countries that are equally concerning. One country, and, and those developments are very often not so much in the small part. One country I can think of is the Russian Federation. The Russian Constitutional Court has handed down in July 2015 a landmark decision in which it determined that case law of the European Court of Human Rights may not need to be implemented in case it interferes with, interferes with the Russian concept of sovereignty. Now, what happened then was a legislation. Legislation was adopted that allowed the Russian Constitutional Court to review decisions by the Strasbourg Court. And just last week, there was the bombshell that uh, the Russian Constitutional Court has declared the judgment on UCOS, uh, in which uh, the Russian authorities were obliged to pay about $2 billion in compensation to, to shareholders of UCOS, not admissible in the Russian uh, well, in the Russian Equally interesting. We read textbooks on international law in Russia. You see that the concept of sovereignty by Karl Schmidt is much more portrayed in a possibly favorable way than the concept of sovereignty by Hans Kelsen. So my question is whether we are actually witnessing here, or also Brexit might be an argument. My question is whether we are actually seeing here a, a development in which states are reconfigurating their concept of state sovereignty, in which probably the United States might only be a symptom of the global development. I'm going to exercise the moderator's prerogative here um, and just ask, I'm, I'm not sure there is a, a, a rethinking of the concept of sovereignty. If you look at the, what's happened in, in, in Russia on these issues, and it goes back a number of years, um, they finally had to confront the possibility that decisions coming from Strasbourg uh, would require actions in conflict with their constitution. Uh, and so the, the Duma enacted a statute that says if we get one of those, uh, our Supreme Court can interpret, in effect, interpret that um, decision in order to remove the unconstitutional part. That is to say that the, uh, the lower courts don't have to comply with that part of the decision that conflicts with the Constitution. Yes, clearly, uh, the, the Russian um, um, legal and, and political system is having to confront the fact that when they ratified the European Convention on Human Rights and subjected themselves to the decisions in Strasbourg, they probably didn't quite understand what, what they were getting into. But I'd ask you this, if we were hypothetically party to such a system and the court issued a decision that says, the treaty says, and this is an actual example, hypothetical but real enough, uh, you must uh, prohibit propaganda for war, we would say, no, we can't do that because it's contrary to our First Amendment. We have, in fact, confronted exactly the same situation in ratifying a very important, one of the most fundamental uh, issues, uh, uh, human rights treaties, where we had to take a reservation to that. Uh, so I'm not sure this is a, a totally unique situation. It's been confronted by states before, but it does show, you're quite right, it shows the tension between uh, sovereignty and what we might say a, glo a growing global judicialization. I don't think this is an entirely unique thing. It, from a human rights point of view, it might be regrettable, but I, I'm not so sure that uh, uh, personally, I, I, I fully understand the concerns that they have, and, and we as a, as a constitutional democracy would have some of the same concerns. That's probably not the answer you were expecting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, right. I, I, I mean, I think it's it's an eternal issue. It's an eternal struggle between between you know the European concept of margin of appreciation. How much do you allow? Uh, whether it's a a state in the international sense, or whether it's a, a subunit of a state, a, a small s state in the U.S. sense. Uh, <clears throat> you know, how how much do you do you say, hey? that has to trump no matter what others think uh, versus versus how much you go with a more centralized approach to resolving problems. I, I do think you're no question about it that we are seeing both in the United States and in much of Europe and elsewhere as a, a sort of revitalized uh, nationalist populism that that in many states from from the United Kingdom uh, to France to Russia in the U.S. has taken the form of um, certainly at least a lot of rhetoric that is more hostile to international law as, and viewing it as infringing on, on nationalist understandings of sovereignty and popular culture. 
uh, how enduring that will be, uh, whether that fundamentally changes anything about the international architecture. Again, no crystal ball. Uh, you know, I think I think you know we'll we'll find out in ten years whether this was a blip and things kind of reverted back, or whether this is the beginning of an unraveling. Yes, in the back, please. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a hard question to to answer. But let's see if either of our panelists want to take a swing. Uh, well, I guess I take that more as sort of a comment than a question. I mean, I think like most people who are campaigning, he has made a number of statements that uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that he will be taking a dramatically different approach to the conflict with ISIS than than President Obama has. Uh, you know, he said that he has got. Uh, certain things that he wants to do, but uh, I, it's not clear yet what different approach uh, uh, he would take. We'll, 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 we'll have to see. Professor, are you seeing in the back? Yes, I have a question. After the, uh, the adoption of the Security Council resolution in December, uh, President Nick Trump tweeted for the United Nations think will be different after January 20th. Uh, and I know that he met with the Secretary General, the new Secretary General in Paris, and so there, are, there are some fears of some concern in, uh, in the international cycle, in particular the United Nations, that this administration may freeze, as was advised by John Bolton, because there was John Bolton one day, and some people say that he will not use advise uh, the Trump administration to freeze the U.S. contribution to the U.N. And, uh, but there are some fears in the, in the UN that uh, this administration will freeze the, the contribution to the United Nations as it as, as was, uh, was done in the past by, by another administration regarding the UNESCO. Uh, if this is not really a proper matter of international law, and so on, it doesn't matter because that would really undermine the work, the work of uh, the My guess is that's something that they will certainly look at very hard. Uh, the Re Republicans and conservative Republicans in particular have really always been extremely critical of the United Nations. Uh, 
that said, you know, the Bush administration came into office with a lot of people who are very critical about the UN, and yet we fully funded and met uh, the U.S. obligations uh, to the to to the UN. So it'll be interesting. I'm sure it's something that they're gonna that they're gonna look at uh, hard. Uh, uh, but I would not necessarily, and, and, and a number of members of Congress have come out and, and said that they think they ought to withhold contributions, uh, but I think it's too early to say. Since we're almost up the aisle, I'm actually going to mention, I'm going to veer off on a tangent just because I'm surprised it hasn't come up, uh, but it's sort of related to the UN, is, uh, is the International Criminal Court, uh, which is all perennially controversial and divisive topic. Uh, and you know, the question would be, and I'll be interested in Rose's thoughts on this, uh, is you know, what could the Trump administration do with respect to the US approach to the International Criminal Court? Now, of course, the United States is you know, not a party to the Rome Statute, uh, and the American Service Members Protection Act is on the books. Uh, the Bush administration uh, 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 took a more uh, middle-of-the-road approach in the second term of a sort of a, a uh, uh, live and let live approach with the ICC uh, where we helped the ICC with respect to certain investigations that we supported such as in Sudan uh, and the Lord's Resistance Army and others and I would note that actually uh, Republican-controlled Congress has actually passed a rewards for justice program that uh, that provides American taxpayer money for Lord's Resistance Army people to be delivered to the ICC. There's a little provision at the bottom that says nothing. Nothing is this is intended to be an endorsement of the ICC, but you know it's clearly saying, which is what the Bush administration's position was in the second term, is look, we don't we don't think the ICC is perfect. Um, um, and we certainly don't want them to come after us, but they are sort of the only game in town when it comes to international justice for certain terrible crimes of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. So we've been willing to support it uh, when, when in our interest to do so. So what will be interesting is whether the Trump administration decides to sort of back up from that um, and things they could do to be you know, less uh, engaged would be uh, to stop all assistance to the ICC. Basically say, we think the ICC is so bad that, that not only do we not want it to investigate us, but we don't want it to investigate anyone, so we're not going to help them on anything. So they, they could take that position. Um, I do think we'll probably see some more uh, hostile rhetoric towards the ICC because it has some investigations open right now of both the United States and Afghanistan and of Israel. So I could imagine that might be ramped up a little bit. Uh, uh, and then the uh, we could stop attending as an observer the assembly, what's called the Assembly of State Parties, which is the essentially the annual or biannual conference of uh, members of the Rome Statute. We're, since we're not a party, we can't attend formally, but we attend as an observer. Uh, and the Obama administration took the position that it was better to go and sort of sit in the back of the room to see what others were doing. Uh, the, the Trump administration could decide they don't want to even do that. So um, I do think that, you know, going way back to the beginning of what why, might we expect, I think that could be a little bit of a sort of a canary in the mine because it's just such a focused thing, the approach to the ICC. Will they essentially continue what has been a, a pretty much consistent arc from the second term of the Bush administration through the Obama administration? Uh, uh, or will they go back to uh, the much more, uh, I, I guess I would say, ho hostile approach of the first term of the Bush administration and stop cooperating even with respect to uh, certain certain investigations uh, that the United States has historically supported. Rose, I know, is an expert on this. So she'll well, and, and here I would again take the Bill O'Reilly position if I were, if I were advising Donald Trump. I, I would be saying, you may hate it, but it doesn't really hurt you, frankly, and there are maybe moments when it can help you. And it's always better to be in the room than not to be in the room. You can decide case by case whether and how much and what kind of support to provide. Uh, and why pick a fight that you don't have to pick? You know, wait until the fight comes to you. Why would you do this? Does that hold any sway with 
Donald Trump. I have no idea, but that, that certainly, I think, my guess is that that's the advice he will be getting from many of his uh, more seasoned advisors, precisely because of the trajectory that John mentioned, that the Bush administration came to that conclusion essentially on their own after a period of, of extreme hostility to the court. Uh, and the Obama administration similarly was not certainly not ready to fully embrace the court, the court, but but also essentially said, you know, we got we have reservations, we have issues, but clearly there are many situations in which this is in our interest, and we certainly share, as a matter of principle, uh, we share the commitment to international justice, and so we'd rather be in the room, even though that doesn't stop the sort of constant low-level sniping that occurs. Uh, that will continue, I think, regardless. So, so I, my, my, my prediction would be that probably, you know, unless something happens in one of the pending investigations that, that turns it into a flashpoint, something really controversial, my guess is that which that would be, which it could, which it absolutely could, um, you know, but, but barring that, my guess is that the Trump, Trump administration will continue that sort of cautious engagement approach. We've reached the end of our time. I want to thank our panelists for this presentation and also ask you to join uh, us in thanking the Federalist Society and the American Brains for hosting it. Thank you for coming. Thank you.